So when I do a hip replacement, I do what's called a direct anterior approach to the hip or a muscle aspiring approach to the hip. What that involves is I make an incision over the front of the hip and I go between the muscles, I don't cut them. The hip is a ball and socket joint. And what we do is I remove the old ball off of the thigh bone. Now, the thigh bone isn't solid, it's hollow. So I prepare the inside of this bone to accept a stem that sits in here. It's a very tight fit, a scratch fit, and the bone will actually grow into a surface on the outside of the stem. I then put a new ball on top of that. On the cup side, I clean out the cup and I prepare it for a new cup that will go in there. And, and essentially what happens is, is, is the native cup looks a little bit like a saucer. It's a little shallow, but I then deepen that to make it look a little bit more like a soup bowl and then put this new metal cup inside. This also has a special rough and surface on the back of it that the bone will grow into. And then I put a plastic liner inside of that so that instead of bone rubbing on bone, there's going to be the new ball on that plastic. So I think of the decision to have a hip replacement as being predicated on two different things. One is, have you tried everything short of a hip replacement to preserve your function and your quality of life? And that's a discussion that you and I have uh, in terms of conservative treatment measures. And part of my role is to make sure that you've done all of those things. Uh, and then your role is to have actually tried all of those things. The second part really is what you tell me. So you and I decide together, have you done everything that you can short of a hip replacement? And then you tell me, I can't live with this anymore. It's impacting my quality of life and the things that I want to be doing to such an extent that I'm ready to have a hip replacement. So there's a reason that we don't go straight to hip replacement right out of the gate when someone has hip arthritis or hip pain. And that's because there are risks associated with hip replacement surgery. Anytime you have an operation, there are gonna be risks. There's potential for damage to nerves, blood vessels, muscles, ligaments, tendons, bone, infection, blood clot. Parts can wear out, parts can get loose, artificial hips can dislocate, legs can be different lengths after surgery. I do a lot of things to try and reduce those risks. We give you antibiotics around the time of surgery. We get you up and moving quickly after the operation. I actually use a computer uh, at the time of surgery to help you restore your leg lengths in something called offset and make sure that the implants are, are, are positioned optimally. But I certainly can't guarantee that nothing bad won't happen. While those risks are rare, rare isn't zero. What I do guarantee every patient I operate on is that I will always do my best and I will never lie. You know, compared to even when I trained not that many years ago, surgery is quite a bit different. Probably the biggest is pain control around the time of surgery. Not that long ago, we were giving patients a ton of narcotics. And while it did an okay job of controlling pain, it actually caused some of its own problems. Uh, upset stomachs, urinary retention, constipation, and just feeling goofy, not feeling like yourself. So now what we're doing is what we call multimodal which means that we come at pain a bunch of different ways. And because we come at it a bunch of different ways, uh, that means that we we're able to mitigate or avoid some of the, the side effects that we see of, of, of these other medications. The other big thing is we get people up much faster than we used to. Uh, all of my patients are generally up and walking the day of surgery after their hip replacement or their knee replacement. And that just helps you feel more normal. It helps with your appetite. It helps just getting back into a routine. And as human beings, we are creatures of habit and routine. The other big thing that I love to have my patients do is the day after surgery, we have everybody shower. I tell patients there are two things that make you feel human after an operation. The first is brushing your teeth, and the second is washing your hair. The decision to go forward with a hip replacement is based on two things. Have you done everything short of an operation to try and work around your hip pain and your limitations? And two, is it bad enough to justify an operation? The youngest I've ever done a joint replacement is 14. The oldest I've ever done an elective joint replacement is 101. 
And so if you have problems that are limiting or, or uh, negatively impacting your quality of life, you know, that's when you really do need to talk about something like this. You know, the biggest misconception I think right now about hip replacement surgery is that you're either too young or you're too old. And that's just not the case. 